what I wanted to do is talk about uh, from a very particular perspective, which is in fact, you know, sort of the story, the arc of my particular career, going through the development of new accelerators and why we do that. And the, the origin actually starts with high energy physics and there's a good uh, amount of history in the, the uh, at Argonne per se, and I, uh, this is actually where I started. I worked in the precursor of the AWA group on the first plasma weight field experiments. And so uh, we do a lot of things at UCLA um, in the advanced accelerator and light source world. And what the, uh, uh, the, the takeaway from that is that it's all traditionally been uh, uh, pushed by high energy physics. And, of course, we'll see, and of course, you know, because of where we are inside of uh, the uh, lecture hall of the, uh, of, of the advanced photon source, uh, that uh, a lot of the emphasis is not in high energy physics anymore. Ne ne nevertheless, the frontier is pushed uh, in some way by both. Now, if you look at the, the history of high energy um, uh, particle accelerators, and you plot the, uh, uh, the particle uh, energy uh, uh, in terms of its uh, 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 time history, you see an exponential increase uh, over time that uh, actually starts to fail. There we go. Okay, so. Uh, you see that uh, somewhere around 1990, uh, the idea that we would uh, exponentially grow in energy uh, off into the future uh, was somehow revealed to be uh, unmaintainable. And that's the, the, uh, you can see from the, the rest of this, uh, uh, of this plot where we indicate the energy associated with any given generation of accelerator, you see that they all contribute to slowly but surely building up this exponential energy reach. Uh, and of course what we did was we ran out of uh, 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 the ability to, 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 to do this be based on the fact that we didn't have any new generations of, uh, of, it, of accelerators that would notably increase the energy reach. Okay, so the problem is that we're uh, somehow needing to get to gigavolt per meter which is something like a factor of 30 higher than we, w what we use today. So this uh, is kind of uh, the idea that we're going to try to stay on this Moore's law for high energy physics is, uh, compels us to look into uh, the, how to go forward. Uh, a, a word about that plot is that, uh, is that uh, you can say, well, wh why do you expect to go forward? Uh, I refer you to Astronomy, observational astronomy, if you look at the resolving power of a telescope since Galileo, it has been for basically 400 years on the same doubling path, okay? In fact, right now we are ahead of where we should be because of a generational uh, uh, idea, which is segmented telescopes. And so now we have a 30 meter telescope, which is effectively something that you could have extrapolated in the year 1700. Okay, so we should expect the future. I met this guy at Wisconsin when I was, uh, when I was starting off at, uh, in grad school. He was 82 years old at that point. Uh, this is uh, inspiration for younger people in the field. He invented the Betatron. His name was Don Kirst. And that, the Betatron is uh, the device he's looking into. Uh, 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 Professor Kirst is violating the dictum, never align the beam with your good eye. Uh, this, is what, uh, this is what you end up with, though. Something was a tabletop, and now it's a mountaintop, effectively. And uh, uh, this, is, this is where we are with the frontier uh, at CERN with a 26-kilometer machine. Now, uh, rings are great, uh, but, of course, uh, uh, one of the things that... Uh, uh, you base your entire livelihood at the APS off of is synchrotron radiation. Synchrotron radiation limits the actual size of a circular machine. Uh, and so for a number of years, and in fact this is sort of where the crisis came in, we should have built a linear collider in 1990 if uh, ambitious people got their way. 
But okay, so we had to go to a linear collider. We thought we knew how to, to, to build it. We thought we knew how to have the accelerating gradient that got, got us there, but we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, quite have that. And we're still sort of searching for uh, the magic there. And uh, uh, some of the uh, magic recipe is going to be upcoming. Now, the point, of course, is that you have a uh, power scaling here uh, for the loss uh, of uh, 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 of energy to synchrotron uh, radiation, and this scales as the energy to the fourth over, uh, over r squared. So you can only win so much even by going to monstrously large radii of curvature. So in the high energy physics context, that's a disease. In the present context, right here where we are, it's actually a, the solution to all your problems which is uh, that you build rings dedicated to production of synchrotron radiation. And we don't have to tell you, uh, this particular audience, exactly how important that is. Um, and in fact, uh, as, I, as I give this talk, the interesting thing that, that, uh, that springs to mind is that, of course, uh, you can see uh, the killer application of uh, X-ray protein crystallography uh, enabled by Light so X-ray light sources uh, that are typified by APS, for instance. Um, and, of course, what uh, is a key missing ingredient in the third generation is coherence. Now, uh, in the upgraded APS, you're actually going to be looking to, uh, uh, to introduce that. Um, where I'm from, actually, we followed a different path, uh, and this path has been uh, equally successful. Uh, as the, uh, uh, as the uh, new types of storage rings, if not more so, um, capturing uh, imagination and investment worldwide. And this is the, uh, the X-ray free electron laser. And uh, sort of the repurposing of the Slack uh, LINAC for the X-ray FEL uh, is, a, is a very nice lesson in the uh, 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 dominance of basic energy sciences type applications over high energy physics in the accelerator field these days. So the whole thing uh, was based on uh, repurposing of the, uh, uh, of the LINAC. Now with LCLS2 you'll get a new, uh, a new LINAC. But basically uh, this was uh, just uh, sort of the world's most high impact bootleg. So what is the X-ray FEL? We need to understand that because we need to understand what its limits are so that we can understand uh, how to take all of the things, again, that come from high, originally from high energy physics uh, that, that developed the fields of high brightness beams and tell you what, uh, uh, what we need to uh, borrow and utilize from uh, that field. So basically, the free electron laser is a three-wave interaction between a static magnetic field uh, that's periodic a radiation field, which uh, has a particular uh, um, well-known uh, resonance condition, uh, and this uh, 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 interacts with a high-intensity beam. The high-intensity beam self-organizes. So these are pictures of the electrons uh, as they bunch tightly into this uh, self-organization instability. They radiate coherently. And lo and behold, you get somewhere between uh, six and eight orders of magnitude uh, larger amount of flux uh, naturally uh, than with incoherent uh, undulator radiation. So why does this happen? It happens because the beam is bright. And bright means both simultaneously intense, dense, and cold. And the way to quantify that is by this ratio of the current over the transverse emittance squared. Uh, you can view this as effectively the size of uh, the region of phase space. Uh, this should be visualizing it as four dimensions, but also the, how peaked this mountain is. So uh, for a very bright beam, you have a very tight and well-peaked mountain. And the reason why this happened, uh, why the FEL revolution happened, is basically a device, which is the... Uh, radio frequency photo injector, and uh, at UCLA we built something like, uh, of the first 18 of them, we probably built the first, a dozen of them, and uh, uh, it's a good trick to know uh, because uh, what you get out of it is some science. Okay, so this is a very parochial uh, view 
of what we will call the four generations of FEL uh, after the generations of light sources. So we did first an experiment in the basement uh, of UCLA where we saw a very small amount of gain, effectively a factor of six or something like this. And so we just saw the statistics of the starting up of gain. Uh, I just had started doing these experiments with the original proposer of the X-ray free electron laser, Claudio Pellegrini. And the reason why I did them is because I was convinced it wouldn't work. Okay. Uh, and I, I, was, uh, I was wrong. Uh, actually, I was partially right because I, I said it doesn't really work the way people say it does because it turns out that uh, this is a much more robust system than people appreciated at, at the time. And that is that every little fold in phase space produces some artifact in the way gain works. Uh, so this goes through to the first real proof of principle where we saw a factor 10 to the 5 in gain in the self-amplified spontaneous emission uh, free electron laser. Uh, then we move to the VISA experiment where we see saturation. And this is only in 2003. You saw a saturation at uh, Ludl uh, uh, slightly before this. And so the proof of principle is only accomplished basically six, seven years before the actual device. Now, this is really astonishing. And if you think about, like, so you, you think about fusion, you think about uh, what we'll talk about a little bit later, which are advanced accelerators, plasma accelerators. Everyone's got a 25-year timeline. This all happened in basically a decade, which is really astonishing, and I'm very grateful to have been able to take part in it. Okay, so uh, it's a success uh, that's quite notable. Uh, and uh, there's a proliferation of all of these uh, uh, machines around the world. Uh, uh, and so what's the problem? The problem is that uh, uh, there's a, a certain limit to the actual number of users you can, uh, uh, you can service this way. And so uh, given the oversubscription, which there really is no doubt about, uh, you have uh, uh, to either build more big facilities or figure out a way to proliferate uh, the facilities. And so for me as a university uh, protagonist, I was convinced that what we should be doing is putting uh, a free electron laser in every, uh, every basement. So let me try to convince you of a certain recipe. So uh, a lot of these things are, are, uh, look conventional, and we start just by chipping away at the problem uh, with something which is, is interesting and actually gives you a fair amount of leverage, which is start with new undulators. And so we have a lot of ideas about this. I'm just going to give you the most uh, conventional uh, one first. I'll show you some crazier ones later. But this is just a cryogenic uh, undulator using uh, presidemium. And uh, this allows one to uh, use um, a very high brightness beam out of uh, next generation elect uh, electron sources, uh, along with short period down to probably, uh, we, we've gotten this device down to seven millimeter period. And so what this does is it scales the radiation wavelength down Remember that uh, uh, it's just lambda undulator over uh, two gamma squared is the scaling that we're after. And so uh, if we shorten this period from sort of the many centimeters to the, uh, 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 to the fraction of a millimeter, we can actually lower the energy demand in the uh, um, uh, accelerator by some notable factor, call it, uh, call it three, uh, which is, uh, makes the whole system quite a bit smaller. Uh, if you make the beam bright, uh, bright enough, you get also a shrinking of the uh, actual uh, time that you need to spend in the undulator as well. So this, again, lowers the, de the demands of the length of the accelerator, uh, uh, the energy demands directly, and the length of the undulator. Uh, and then you go on to what is actually a bit harder, first undulator, second high brightness beam, and then you reinvent the accelerator. So this is the recipe. We've got to do all three, all three things. So if you think about this recipe from the point of view of, uh, of performance, here's a, a test case that came from some of the earliest uh, days back in 2010 when we first started the cryogenic undulator uh, program that I talked about. We started uh, simulating w what we could do with these free electron lasers. And 
Indeed, with a 2 GeV beam, we could get to LCLS energies on the fifth harmonic uh, with non-trivial powers. And uh, of course, everything seems to be uh, happening in a very short uh, distance, and that is uh, uh, 40 meters to uh, 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 complete uh, saturation. And indeed, in this case, uh, I'm sorry, this, this is, sorry, this is two different cases. This is uh, uh, the seven and a half angstrom FEL, and this is extending it down to uh, basically uh, 10 times the photon energy of the LCLS. You can do that in 40 meters. Uh, since then, uh, these were based on uh, state-of-the-art in uh, injector uh, techniques at, as of 2010. We know how to do much better uh, uh, th than that, and uh, we're proceeding on uh, that type of uh, I innovative research as we go. Now, what you do uh, at a certain point is you say, well, you know, if we uh, can get this far using uh, more or less conventional undulators. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the uh, uh, more um, uh, unconventional systems. And this is basically uh, a micro uh, electric m machine system uh, undulator, MEMS system, and here's a picture of basically a cutaway of, uh, of the system. This is an electromagnetic undulator where you can tune each period uh, uh, by itself, and uh, uh, so this is a very robust technology, and we've put it together. You see, this exists. This is not a, this is not a design drawing. Of course, what you see is that uh, you know we're going down in uh, uh, radiation wavelength by shortening the undulator uh, period, but of course, K, which is the a proxy for the coupling to the free electron laser, gets smaller, and we, uh, it means that the gain is not going to be as robust. So we have to do a couple things. We have to say, well, let's make the beam brighter uh, and also make it at some point denser. And that is uh, we need to focus the beam harder because that's the gain medium associated with the free electron laser. OK, so uh, uh, what, do we, what do we do? We use the same approach, build uh, uh, miniaturized quadrupoles, and these are basically MEMS uh, fabricated quadrupoles. The interesting thing about this scheme is that it's very surprising. If you just think about it uh, kind of naturally, uh, you say, well, uh, what I would like to do is, um, oh, this, I think we're not lined up right here. Well, uh, what I would like to, uh, to do is just have you think about, like, if you take the desire to make a very large magnetic field, call it a, uh, nearly a Tesla on the pole piece. What happens uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you shrink everything down? The current densities go up a lot. And so you think, well, you can't build this. So it turns out, as you miniaturize these things and you place them on uh, uh, silicon substrates, that the cooling is much more effective than you might have thought. And so these, these MEMS quadrupoles can get to three kilotesla per meter, which is about two orders of magnitude more than uh, what you would naively think uh, exists in uh, uh, a standard uh, electromagnetic quad. So this is what it looks like. Here are the first proof of principle uh, uh, tests of focusing uh, done at UCLA. And here's uh, the desire to uh, basically produce a free electron laser, which we call Samurai, uh, based on uh, a high brightness uh, injector that has an inherent pulse compression. So instead of having sort of 50 amp beam come out of here, uh, the beam undergoes this uh, velocity bunching compression immediately. And by the time you get uh, to the end of this thing, uh, you have maybe 500 amps, or uh, we're designing for 300 amps. And so we're just building a small beam line at UCLA, which is, uh, takes us to uh, 63 MeV, but it has a, the, the, the reach of a uh, EUV free electron laser. Okay, so this is basically what uh, we're trying to get at. Uh, 63 MeV beam, 20 picocoulomb of charge, and low emittance. Now, uh, the interesting thing about this is that we know how to make the ratio of charge to emittance about a factor of eight times better than uh, what we get out of the hybrid photo injector right now. So uh, uh, this is a moving target. Um, 
Does it work? It works well and it works in a strange fashion because now uh, the beam is very bright, very dense, highly focused, and so space charge turns on. Even though we're running uh, basically a very short wavelength uh, free electron laser, you can do this exercise even in the soft x-ray, and you find that you have a space charge dominated beam. It basically acts like a plasma instead of a uh, collection of charged particles like you might be familiar with in, uh, uh, at, at a high energy uh, synchrotron radiation source. Uh, and so what you see is that as the beam undergoes its bunching, that uh, uh, it tries not to. And what that does is it slows the whole process down and makes it more efficient. And so what that means is if you can get the beam plasma frequency, which is uh, indicated by the density over gamma cubed, uh, then, and, and square root, what you, what you get out of that, uh, if the frequency is as high as the, uh, the inverse of the gain length, that you get a much more efficient system, okay? And so that di di diagram, what that says is that uh, uh, the gain length is going to increase as the plasma frequency. Uh, this is the fractional increase of the gain length. So first thing that you do is increase the gain length but we indicate that the efficiency goes up by lengthening the vertical axis here. And so what we get is something kind of phenomenally uh, uh, well-performing, and that is the uh, Keck Samurai EUV free electron laser. Uh, this is something that looks a little bit like, say, the Fermi free electron laser at Synchrotron uh, Trieste. Uh, but it's saturating in one and a half meters. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting test. What did we do here? We didn't even take the state of the art of the uh, 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 of electron beams. We used a good uh, high brightness electron beam, and then we said, "All right, we're going to uh, use that highest brightness beam, and then we're going to just keep squeezing on the undulator techniques until we get to uh, and focusing techniques until we get to something new." And we do get to something new. So this is uh, a free electron laser in your basement that uh, is uh, three orders of magnitude higher brightness than HHG. Uh, and what we could call this is generation 4.1 on, uh, on light sources. Okay. So what did we not do? We said, all right, let's leave this whole question of the length of the, uh, uh, of the accelerator alone for just a minute, okay? And uh, so what we, we need to do is um, uh, take the uh, 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 various considerations for the accelerator and understand how it is that you can actually make the accelerator smaller. Now, the first thing you need to notice is that if you just tried to take uh, an accelerator with a bore that's this big and fill it with a gigavolt per meter field, you, can, you cannot afford the power bill, okay? Uh, you, you have a stored energy that goes like basically uh, the square of, uh, uh, of the wavelength, that's total stored energy in the beam. And so what you need to do is basically scale down uh, the, the, the size of the wavelength. So we're going to take uh, an accelerator that looks like this and turn it into pencil lead, okay? And that's actually what we're going to need to do. And so all the length scales and the time scales become much smaller, okay? So you really are reinventing uh, the accelerator at this point. And all things change. You're talking about charges that need to go down. You're talking about materials, the environment that you're accelerating in that needs to be different. Maybe it has different symmetries. Maybe it has different materials. Maybe it's plasma. Uh, and certainly, in the, in the end, uh, if the wavelengths are getting shorter, we know how to make very short wavelength accelerators, which are done with, uh, or very short wavelength radiation sources, which are lasers, but l that's a little extreme, right? I and mean, if you want to go from, say, uh, 10 centimeter RF wavelength that you might be f familiar with down to one micron, which uh, a standard uh, uh, infrared laser, uh, uh, then you find that uh, that jump of 10 to the 5 in scale might be a little challenging, okay? So what uh, actually you need to think about is, what is uh, how far do you need to go to just make it happen? And that turns out to be terahertz, and terahertz turns out to be where I started my career at Argonne uh, on something called Wakefield Acceleration. So Wakefield Acceleration 
as a way of directly exciting fields inside of something, okay? That something could be indicated here as a, a, a hollow uh, core dielectric tube. So here's a beam coming through uh, the dielectric, and you can see the Cherenkov radiation uh, as, as the fields encounter the dielectric itself. Beam is propagating in vacuum. And then you can see this wave developing behind uh, the, the so-called drive beam, and you place your accelerating beam here. This is a, the simplest configuration of a so-called Wakefield accelerator. Uh, if you do it in dielectric, or metal for that matter, uh, you're constrained to certain field levels, and we, we sort of on a journey of discovery about that. Uh, uh, of course, you can, if you're worried about breaking the system, you should uh, just break it from the start, accept your misery, and use, uh, use plasma. And this is actually where, again, I started my career and where uh, my student, Ryan Roussel, who's in the audience, is back here for another round, and we'll show you his stuff at the end of, the, uh, at the end of this. One of the interesting things about this is that uh, energy, the, putting energy into a beam and putting it into a tight packet allows us to do, a, uh, to do exactly the trick we're looking for. We want to store a lot of energy, put it into a long accelerator, and excite terahertz, okay? And so uh, 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 this is actually a format. Uh, storing energy in a beam is a common enough theme. Think about inertial confinement uh, fusion, which is going to be particle-based in the end. All right, so let's see. Uh, this part is just uh, numerics, right? You just say, let's take a beam uh, and let's put it in, uh, uh, let's put as much charge into it as possible. And of course, the, the energy in the beam is going to be uh, uh, dependent on the number of, uh, of, of such charges and the energy per charge. And if you look at where we are in technology today, you can see that the facet facility at SLAC, where we do uh, the bleeding edge uh, uh, research in Wakefield acceleration, this gives us 60 joules, which is a lot. I mean, think about uh, trying to get that out of a laser and think about trying to get it out of a laser more than once every, say, minute, right? So, uh, in fact, you can get this 60 joules at least 60 times uh, per second, uh, and uh, we'll follow that road. One of the things that, of course, is happening here is that uh, the Wakefield's, uh, the pulse of electrons has to be short. It has to have a time uh, structure short compared to the wavelength of the, uh, uh, of the uh, radiation, uh, this coherent uh, uh, Cherenkov radiation in the case of a dielectric wake field uh, or coherent plasma acceleration uh, in, in the case of plasma wake fields. Uh, it has to be, if you're going to terahertz, it has to be sub-picosecond. That is sort of like falling off a log these days. When I first came to Argon years and years ago, uh, we were dealing with 20 picosecond beams, and that was, that was state of the art then. Now uh, we can get easily 20 femtosecond beams with a lot of charge in them, okay? So the door is open to do all sorts of good things, uh, and uh, we'll see why that scaling is important. So again, this is the dielectric wake field accelerator. You can have this sort of collinear geometry. You could have it look a little bit like a, a more standard accelerator, so-called two-beam accelerator, where you decelerate uh, the drive beam in a separate channel, which you can think of as a, uh, as a relativistic klystron, and then you take the power and put it into the accelerator per se. Okay, so this is a simple incarnation. We'll see much more complicated incarnations later on where we don't just have a simple tube of dielectric clad with uh, metal. Okay, so it's important to understand uh, exactly how Cherenkov radiation works uh, in, in the scaling of the response of the medium. Uh, it turns out that you could do this uh, simple calculation inside of uh, the environment of a dielectric uh, system, or, uh, and you can easily extend the arguments to, uh, uh, to plasma. So what we learn here is basically uh, uh, something that we'll know for the plasma itself, uh, the plasma case as well. So what you, what you, what you can find is that you have uh, uh, the accelerating wake field, or decelerating at the, on the beam itself, so you're going to calculate exactly what these 
uh, these fields uh, d diverging off of the beam are giving you. And it says that you need to have a lot of charge, and you need to have a small radius of inner radius of the system. That's what, that sets the coupling. And of course, you need to basically have a, a short beam too, which is a, a frequency uh, idea. Now, it turns out that, uh, of course, this A, uh, the inner, ra inner radius of the dielectric, is going to be proportional to the wavelength you're exciting, which, of course, is in turn pro proportional to sigma z. So you get what we, what we call Cherenkov scaling, which is that the, uh, you need to have a fair amount of charge, and you need to have a lot, uh, or you need to have a short beam, OK? Now, uh, just to show you what happens in, in fact, we go back to some of the most interesting uh, high quality data that you, that, that you can imagine for its time. This is 1988. This is the so called uh, uh, AATF at Argonne Excel Advanced Accelerator Test Facility. These are all data points which tell you what's happening with a witness beam that uh, you, take a, you take a witness beam, create it off of a, deg a degraded target here, uh, put it on some adjustable uh, uh, delay here and make it come back married to the same trajectory as the uh, drive beam, but with an adjustable delay. And so here you have uh, the beam energy as a function of delay for the witness beam. And you see this beautiful kind of jump uh, motion up and down, which you could actually resolve even the harmonics of the wake field. It's fantastic. But it's only a, a megavolt per meter. Uh, the Argon group has done a lot of work over the last couple of years uh, to try to make the beam shorter, going to, again, this RF photo injector, which is, uh, saves the wake field accelerator as well as the free electron laser, and comes up with 100 megavolts per meter. But of course, this is th th still uh, uh, kind of not exactly uh, hitting the highest gradients because the emphasis was working on getting to high charge, but not necessarily getting to high frequency or short uh, bunch length. Uh, so uh, 100 megavolts per meter was reached. Uh, we decided to, based on the existence of a, uh, a beam at SLAC at the so-called uh, FFTB about 10 years ago, we decided to shoot that beam through some quartz tubes that were operating in terahertz uh, uh, region. And these are short beams, 20 microns instead of sort of uh, uh, centimeter like they, they, they were at the, at the Argonne uh, Wakefield Accelerator. And what you see is uh, that uh, a simulation here of a multi-mode excitation. And you also see that uh, uh, from the data, oh, I guess the animation didn't work. The data shows that we, got, we get to 5.5 gigavolts per meter of field excitation like this uh, before we disastrously break down the structure. So that really opened the door to dielectric wake field acceleration in the terahertz regime. And the terahertz itself is actually really interesting because, uh, uh, you know, we needed to understand what it did. FFTB closed in 2006, so we moved these experiments on campus. We took basically a dielectric wake field accelerator tube and put a launcher on the end of it. Here's a picture of it in real life. Collect that radiation and do some, uh, 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 oops, hmm, my animation's broken. Okay, uh, and see uh, that uh, uh, we could generate single mode uh, uh, of uh, probably up to 100 megawatts of uh, 0.3 terahertz radiation. Okay. Um, so everything uh, 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 was all well and good, and we waited for the new arrival of uh, the, the facet uh, facility at SLAC, which was uh, the way to get back to very high gradients. And uh, the beam was excellent at, at, the, at the facet facility. So we went from using one centimeter tubes to, in this case, 15 centimeter tubes, starting to look like an accelerator. And we could actually move the energy of the beam a lot. Okay, so here we take uh, the, the beam uh, that has uh, no uh, uh, structure, and uh, we can take, the, uh, 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 take this and move with the structure present 
the entire centroid of the, uh, 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 of, of the energy of the beam, uh, a couple hundred MeV. So this is a real advanced, uh, advanced accelerator. Uh, if we take even just the RMS, or the, sorry, the mean beam energy, we moved at 1.3 uh, 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 GeV per meter over this 15 uh, centimeters. Um, so decelerating a beam, people don't usually get that excited. You gotta accelerate uh, the beam. And so what we did was we chopped the beam, uh, the drive beam into uh, two pieces and made a small witness beam behind it and we could see, look, okay, here's our uh, beam without anything uh, uh, going on, no structure. And then when we put the structure in, we see acceleration of, uh, of the charge. And uh, the most interesting part of this experiment is that the beam propagates stably over 10, 15 centimeters. Uh, it accelerates, and indeed, it pulls... Uh, 75% of the energy out of the, that was stored in the, in, into, in the structure. So this is, was exciting. This is uh, Nature Communications worthy uh, uh, um, publication. Um, but something strange came out of this. And so just to show, because you, know, you think about dielectric uh, uh, accelerators, you think, well, that's kind of boring. It's just a dielectric. We know it's, we describe it by a single parameter, epsilon, and that's it. Then you start thinking about losses, and then you start thinking about nonlinearities, and before you know it, it gets pretty exciting. So uh, here, you can see that what we're doing is we're taking the coherent Trankov radiation. Here's a, kind of this elegant method we have for just pulling uh, the radiation out on an angle. And we go and we do uh, these uh, uh, um, sort of autocorrelation tests. And here's the raw autocorrelation of the terahertz radiation that comes out. We can, with the Kramer's Kronig method, actually recreate the wake field. This looks a little bit like that old AATF data from 1988, which was done in a beautiful but laborious way. This is basically just telling you from the radiation that you know uh, if, if you believe in Kramer's Kronig, which I urge you to believe in, uh, then uh, uh, you can actually ge generate the wake field. Now, so we have the wake field, we see harmonics in it, and we see a lot of damping. Okay, so that's something new and interesting. What does it, uh, what does it come from? Sorry. Uh, well, it's pretty, it's pretty big damping. So when we, when one of the things that we uh, can uh, opine is that it's high field induced damping. And uh, this theory comes from experiments that uh, came out uh, in the last several years using lasers where people shoot a, a, a a very intense laser onto a, a sample and measure induced current di uh, directly and, and deduce that there's conductivity. The other way you can do it is say, well, we're just going to make uh, a bunch of carriers by beam impinging on the, uh, on the dielectric uh, by, uh, itself. So uh, the, if, by taking the beam and slamming it into the dielectric by using an upstream scatterer, we got rid of that second hypothesis and we concentrate on the first hypothesis, which is some sort of uh, uh, damping uh, that's field-based. And of course, what uh, w uh, the high field damping comes from, the initial onset of uh, the valence band and the conduction band touching each other. And this happens at a surprisingly small value of the field. Turns out to be not that far from a gigavolt per meter, which is a very interesting to us. So what do we see? We see a threshold around 800 megavolts per meter. At 500 megavolts per meter, we have a very normal looking autocorrelation, goes on forever, and then Basically, uh, at uh, a, bit, a bit over a gigavolt per meter, we see a disastrous, persistent uh, conductivity. So the question is, why is it persistent? It's persistent, uh, surprisingly, uh, because you think, well, this is a very long wavelength system. Uh, electrons are going to go out, they're going to come uh, uh, come back to, to the, the to their original state if we kind of adiabatically just move the, uh, uh, um, uh, the response of the material up and down. And you, you'd be right about that, except for one thing. There's a scale of the problem now, which is that uh, uh, 
the energy associated with the oscillation after the electron goes from the valence band to the conduction band, the electron is going to have an energy which, if you had done this at a gigavolt per meter at light wavelengths, would have a milli-electron volt. In other words, it's something consistent with, uh, with solid-state physics. Uh, instead, we get something that's on the kilo-electron volt, maybe even 10 kilo-electron volt level, because we're at terahertz. And the electron has a lot of time to accelerate once it moves uh, into the conduction band. So this is kind of new physics, and we're putting this in for uh, uh, publication into uh, nature materials. OK. Uh, so what we need to do is maybe lower the field in the dielectric. Here's some idea that we had uh, for how to do that. Of course, now this dielectric accelerator is going to have a couple of new features photonic confinement, that's up here. And then the fields are going to be modulated, just as in a, a iris-loaded accelerator, by a uh, dielectric that's shaped uh, with, these, with these mini irises. OK, so that's, uh, that's an interesting thing. Uh, it keeps the field out, because naturally, if you have, a, if you have the boundary condition that uh, uh, you have something flat that's going uh, along uh, in the longitudinal direction, that you would have uh, uh, the field leaking into the dielectric because that's the continuity that, uh, that you're after. So instead, we modulate uh, uh, the structure uh, as in this uh, laser-driven structure. So there's a bunch of other things that you might want to look at, uh, like uh, transverse stability. Uh, people who study these things uh, in uh, free electron lasers or e e here at the APS, they understand that uh, beam stability is a key issue, and it's going to get a lot worse if you, uh, uh, if you go to short wavelengths. And uh, in fact, the, a the AWA group looked at this, and they said, if we just do our best effort, we can't go more than a couple hundred uh, uh, MeV per meter. Uh, so we have a workaround for that, which is to change fundamentally what the structure looks like. Okay, and so that is, instead of having a cylinder like every accelerator uh, in history, more or less, every linear accelerator, we have something slab-like because now we have a, a fair amount of energy that we can distribute in what we would call the ignorable direction x, and we can accelerate a ribbon beam. And the ribbon beam in the 2D limit actually has no transverse wake, and beam breakup is strongly suppressed. Um, so this uh, was done, uh, uh, this was uh, looked at experimentally in a lot of different ways. The, uh, uh, the, there's some experiments that we published in 2012, and we have uh, a new one, uh, a new PRL that's coming out uh, pretty soon uh, on the actual beam breakup uh, in facet uh, beams. So that's uh, recent data. The main game is uh, that uh, we can beat down the uh, beam breakup. Transverse wake fields go like the size of the beam in this ignorable direction uh, to the minus 2, while the gradient only goes down to the minus 1. So we can always win. Um, we didn't have a very good experience with metal at these high fields and at these frequencies. And uh, this motivates this uh, idea of photonic confinement. So basically, this is just your, your old friend, the Bragg mirror which is providing confinement in these terahertz systems. Now we have an all dielectric system, and it is confined very well, and we don't have to worry about uh, uh, the heat handling capabilities of metal. You can get even more refined and use photonics, and photonics is, uh, uh, in, in, in a real sense, is three-dimensional uh, 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 game where you have to figure out how to confine and shape the field response in all dimensions. Of course, this is a real obvious thing that's going to happen to you once you start changing the symmetry from a simple cylinder to something that's decidedly three-dimensional and one of the dimensions is very different than the other. So uh, here you have a, this array uh, called a wood pile, and what it does is it controls actually the shape of the field in this so-called x direction. And again, uh, we did experiments on this which showed uh, a lot of things, they're in the field exclusion geometry because the, uh, uh, because the wood pile has that uh, automatically. We used flat beams to clean up the, the spectrum and get rid of transverse wake fields. 
and, uh, and uh, did a full modal uh, study on that. And this is coming out in PRL next week, I believe. Um, one of the things that you can do uh, with, um, the, uh, uh, with the dielectric wake field or any other wake field is you can play a game where you take this uh, driver and you decelerate it slowly, but you accelerate quickly behind it. And this is by, uh, done by ramping a beam uh, as such. And this gives you what's called a transformer ratio. A transformer ratio uh, basically tells you that you, if you want to accelerate a 10 GeV beam, you might only need a 1 GeV driver. Uh, and so here's a simulation of, uh, of this in the dielectric wake uh, 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 world. Uh, here's what it looks like in energy space. Here's the, here's the drive beam down here, very little happening to it, uh, and the accelerating beam, which is originally at the same energy, is way up here. Okay. Can we make these beams? You bet. That's uh, experiments that we did at uh, UCLA. I got the directionality right. Uh, this was done in 2008. And here's something from this year, uh, which was experiments where we actually just used the dielectric wake field accelerator to play with the longitudinal phase space, go through a chicane, and then we end up with this uh, excellent ramped beam. And the people who own the best method for this are actually at Argonne. They have something uh, which is called the energy exchange beamline. Uh, there's actually uh, a, a two energy, ex uh, or sorry, emittance exchange beamline. They're actually uh, exchanging longitudinal and transverse emittance. So you take a transverse mask and, uh, and change the beam uh, shape transversely and then flip that into longitudinal. And here is the ramped beam that comes out of it. So this is actually something that we're going to do. Uh, this is the basis of an experiment we're going to do. All right, so uh, the last deviation is to talk about uh, uh, what happens with plasma, OK? Uh, this is where my story started and where we'll finish uh, today. So we go past breakdown, and what we can do uh, is excite, because plasma is a great mode converter. You put a laser into it, and it converts it into a plasma wave, which is called a plasmon. Uh, so that works, or you can uh, get uh, 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 basically the electron beam. And the electron beam is what we're going to concentrate on. So this is a picture I showed you before where the electron is basically pushing all the electrons out of the way. And it, what it does is it produces an ion, uh, uh, stationary ion column in here, which provides focusing, which is, according to your freshman physics, is basically uh, linear in radius. Uh, and uh, so this is a perfect transport channel. And then you have a little bubble of electromagnetic radiation, which is like you've captured a LINAC and you're pushing it at the speed of light. The exciting part of this is that as you, as you make the density higher, and uh, uh, you, to go to higher density, all you need is a shorter beam to do it, we can uh, get an electric field that is uh, proportional to the square root of that density. And here is the proposal that we have uh, for doing a next generation experiment at facet two, where we get to a teravolt per meter, okay? So this is no joke. It's actually, we have now uh, the uh, uh, energy frontier, uh, uh, basically, if you look at uh, some variation of that uh, Moore's law, uh, so-called Livingston plot that, uh, that I showed you before, here's another, uh, another look at it, and basically, uh, we can make a Livingston plot for uh, plasma accelerators. This is me in graduate school, and this is where we ended up uh, 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 even 10 years ago. So uh, you can see we're on a beautiful exponential rise uh, with no end in sight. Uh, in terms of the maximum energy that's been achieved, uh, this is actually uh, one of the highest energy beams ever produced in a laboratory was done in plasma. And this is, of course, is the tail of the self-accelerated wake, in the self-accelerated wake uh, of a plasma wake field uh, uh, experiment that was done uh, 10 years ago at, uh, at uh, FACET. Okay. Now, of course, this is a spectrum. Here's the original beam, decelerated stuff, accelerated stuff going out above 90 GeV. Again, this is one of the highest energy uh, 
beams ever produced by mankind. But it's not a beam, right? Because it's uh, clearly not localized in energy. Uh, one of the things that happened right around the same time is that laser wake fields, laser driven wakes, turned on and produced, started producing good beams. So here was when it wasn't working and here's when it's working. This is a transverse picture. Good emittances all of a sudden. And lo and behold, instead of having a thousand percent energy spread, you have a few percent. Okay, so that uh, 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 type of scenario, uh, you have these little capillaries that are driven by intense lasers that are maybe in the, ten, uh, in the uh, hundreds of terawatt uh, level, uh, which are actually quite common these days. Uh, here's a, actually a 40 terawatt example where you produce a GeV beam in, say, three centimeters. Okay. Um, so what do you want to do with that? Well, you want to use it. The energy spread uh, is l relatively large, a couple percent. And this is a, a kind of a problem for the free electron laser. So what the first thing you do is shoot it through an undulator and don't show necessarily lasing, but show that you get an intense burst of, uh, uh, of undulator radiation the way you, the way you thought uh, you should. And again, this is sort of uh, uh, ten, nine, ten years ago at uh, the Munich MPQ. And we are doing now the next step, along with our friends at Berkeley, uh, at the so-called Bella Laboratory, to try to bring a lot more exactitude into, into the problem. And that is to make sure that we get a, uh, uh, a good beam and manipulate it in a way that uh, we can drive a free electron laser. So uh, here is just a kind of the uh, uh, schematic of what we're hoping to do. We're hoping for exponential gain instead of uh, incoherent uh, light. And the question is, how do you do it? Well, it turns out that the longitudinal phase space you can parameterize by a certain density per MeV uh, in, in this, in uh, the uh, uh, energy uh, uh, spectrum that is produced. So why does that matter? Because we're going to do a trick, which is you take the beam out of the end of the plasma, which is you know sort of tens of picocoulombs. Now, it's not small, but it's in a femtosecond. So you have kiloamps, many kiloamps. But it's a bad beam from the point of view of energy spread. So you have a couple percent RMS. We'd like to make that more like 0.1%, something like that, 0.2%. Uh, so we need, to order, uh, we need to go down by an order of magnitude. So what you do is you just take a chicane, run the beam through it, and stretch it. And then the slice energy spread is uh, much smaller, and the FEL is sort of going to work. This is what we're building at UCLA. And this is what's expected to happen. And that is that... Uh, uh, we're going to see lasing on undulators that are coming up from UCLA, in fact, are already there, and uh, will produce uh, lasing. We can do better. So this is, the, this is the final step. Take a plasma and use it to make beams much better. Okay? How does that work? You take this bubble that we talked about before, and what we do is we shine a laser directly into it. And this is the laser propagating forward in the beam frame. But what it did was it liberated some high ionization threshold background gas, which is helium in this case with a lithium background. And electrons are injected. And they're injected in a highly controlled way. Now you can make the beam good. So here's a design study from my student, uh, Yunfang Shi, that we published five years ago which shows that the emittance can be at the 10 to the minus 8 level, again, with kiloamps of beam. And now the energy spread right away is 10 to the minus 4. And we don't want to lengthen this one. We want to use it. Okay. So the question is, does this work? Oh. Yeah, it works. <laughs> we'll show you the movie. We had to inject the laser from the side due to experimental uh, uh, difficulties. And here's what, the, uh, here's what all the trajectories of the liberated electrons uh, look like. So just to show you, this is the first experiment. It was not optimized. And uh, the, uh, uh, normally you would have the laser coming in, focusing, and then 
uh, kind of diffracting out as it goes forward, highly focused at a, only a certain point. In any case, you still see the electrons here that are very, very tightly uh, uh, bunched. Okay, so let's see. Let's look at, uh, this is what uh, the experimental layout is. Uh, you get kind of a hint about why we had to do something which we might term a compromise, which is that uh, we injected from the side, but it was really necessary for us to be able to do the femtosecond timing along with the micron uh, 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 pointing uh, jitter and so forth. We had to get that all done right. And so uh, in the first experiments, we came in from the side. There's a whole lot of diagnostics here, a fantastic new way of measuring the... Uh, uh, the synchronization at the femtosecond level, and here are the results. Uh, we have uh, something which is called torch, where we basically disturb the plasma a lot. So if the beam comes, bef uh, if the laser comes before the beam, uh, you get injection because of a distortion in the plasma. But it's a kind of a violent one, and the, uh, the uh, emittance and the energy spread are not good. Here's a mixed case, and as we turn the energy down, we don't distort the plasma, and we get this so-called Trojan horse, where we just put that beam directly into the uh, acceleration bubble, and here's what comes out on the spectrometer. A couple percent R RMS energy spread, which we know why we have it, because we're not using the ideal geometry yet, but already uh, one and a half millimeter millirating. Okay, so... Uh, we're in pretty good shape on this. We know where, where to go next. Uh, lots of things are going to happen in the near future about uh, the uh, uh, plasma wake fields. Uh, just to loop back to this question of uh, ramp beam drivers, uh, we can imagine the Trojan scenario married to uh, a ramped beam, which gives us a high transformer ratio. So we put Trojan injection, uh, we, we do a ramp beam, we take, say, uh, a few hundred MeV beam here at, uh, at Argon, assuming you get your test uh, beam back up, and then you could get a couple MeV beam out of it using uh, a large transformer ratio uh, scheme, and if you use Trojan, you're going to get uh, a good beam. And uh, the, the precursor experiment for this is actually being done at AWA, uh, where I showed you before the absolutely fantastic uh, perfect ramped beam that can be generated there. Uh, this is what we expect here. We can see uh, 120 megavolt per meter fields behind the drive beam. Inside of the drive beam, there are only 20 megavolts per meter decelerating. Here's the plasma source. It's been recon re uh, reconditioned, and it's here. Uh, and so is the student, Ryan Roussel. So uh, just to conclude, uh, with some perspectives, uh, I showed you uh, that uh, the fifth generation light source, uh, it's enabled by uh, pushing on a variety of fronts all at the same time. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, uh, new accelerators, uh, uh, and we'll include in the new accelerator new ways of generating electrons of high super high brightness, and uh, undulators, we have to think a little bit more imaginatively about it. And embedded in this is that uh, there are new time and spatial scales. We're at the terahertz and sort of uh, uh, micron uh, scale. In fact, we're at uh, well subterahertz since we have to resolve many, uh, uh, we have to align and resolve systems at a fraction of a wavelength. Of course, the game is to get to gigavolt per meter. We have done that already. Um, the so-called fifth generation light source that we've been, uh, we've been aimed at is, is actually already working. It's just not the FEL yet. Uh, we have made uh, incoherent Compton scattering sources, which is a whole nother talk, using uh, both laser wake field accelerators and inverse free electron lasers. The Compton source is, is substituting the undulator with a laser. And so lambda undulator is now a micron instead of centimeters. And that means we can get MeV photons. And that's very useful. So this, this light source is already there uh, and uh, making an impact. So the battle for getting to the real free electron lasers engaged, we think that we're going to make a lot of progress. You see that uh, 
Uh, some daring agencies are already embracing it. Uh, the, the Berkeley uh, uh, UCLA thing is uh, funded by the Moore Foundation. And finally, high energy physics still remains interested because the FEL is a very difficult application that uh, can serve as a stepping stone. Thank you.